So here we are, I said, the ultimate nightmare, the sort of worst case scenario. Any bad actor in the world would now be able to find us and it would just be me with a pistol to stop them. But no, not even that, because we're in Canada, so I can't have a pistol. Hey, how are you? Welcome to another episode of I'll Spare You the Details, where we are going through Prince Harry's spare and we only have 40 pages left. So we are roaring to the finish line. The theme of today's episode is desperation. Harry is exceedingly desperate this entire um, section because he is scrabbling desperately for his rights. And he feels like everybody is um, abusing him and mistreating him. Um, he is really derogatory about the queen. He is really dismissive of his father. He keeps trying to insist to us that William is the enemy. Yet time and time again, William keeps sounding like the sanest one among us. I've never seen where somebody tries so hard to paint somebody as the enemy, and yet they come out looking like the hero time and time again. Um, can you imagine writing for over 400 pages with one objective um, and you fail? Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, um, okay, so I just want to get right into this. I don't think that there was anything that came up in the comments from the last video that was like that we needed to like discuss or anything. I think it's really interesting and I haven't, I mean, I've only sort of seen this in the, on my periphery. I, I haven't been um, watching any coverage on it, but I think it's interesting that the very week that I decided to talk about Elton John and Harry's little spat, we see them sitting in the back of a courtroom in England once again at another court case regarding the press. So I guess maybe they, you know, reunited in their grievance. I don't know. I, I don't understand that relationship. But anyway, um, we're here for this book, not for current events. So we'll just get right into this. If you'll recall from last time, we had just finished talking about the fact that Harry, um, Harry wants to come up with some kind of a deal where he and Megan can, you know, kind of chill out whenever and then when they feel like pulling themselves up off the couch. They'll stagger into London and ask if there's any fun events to attend. If not, they'll probably just go back home. And I don't think that that's even a misrepresentation of what their intentions were, because later on, we'll talk about, like in his words, what he was hoping to accomplish. And the things that he says he's willing to come back home for are ceremonies and you know big events, like the fun stuff. The, I get to go stand out on the balcony stuff. Not the day in and day out, you know, representation of charities. And he, he was talking about like, we want to continue on our work. What work is that? He hasn't, with the exception of like way back when talking about um, his work with veterans, he hasn't mentioned any of his charitable work, except for the, like, he'll be like, I had to go to work. I had to go to the office. But when he's at the office, it's all about trying to get ahead of stories in the press. What work has he been doing? So what work does he think he's going to come home for, you know, once he's hammered out this deal in which he gets to just lay on his ass half the time? Okay, so we left off last time where um, he had, he'd already kind of written out one memo, but that got leaked to the press. And so he kind of had abandoned the idea. And then while they were in Vancouver, they decided this is really the life for us you know, playing out on the lawn with our kid, you know, kind of just, you know, going into the village for food when we need it, just kind of like, you know, hanging out. So they thought, how can we make this actually like our real reality? So he'd gone back to Pa, Pa had said, that's all well and good, dear boy, but you have to submit this in writing. It can't just be like a handshake and a, you know, a couple of words between friends. You need to have a plan, a detailed and articulate plan for which one. So he'd been like, I'm not doing that last time you got late. But Paul was like, well, then you're not getting it. So he goes and uh, he gets a plan together in which he had said specifically that they would be willing to renounce their titles if it only meant freedom. <laughs> All he wants is freedom. So they threw that out there so that they could look really like victimized, like this is what it's come to. We're having to throw away the title in order for us to just get a little mental peace. 
they had no intention of here's the thing they didn't think that offer would be taken I, I i can only assume that's why they even put it on the table they wanted to look as desperate as possible so that everyone would buy the story that they were so um horribly burdened and put upon that this is like this is how far it had come um but anyway they thrown that in for extra drama that they would renounce their titles and um Pa had been like, thanks for the memo, but when you get back to England, I'm actually not going to be there. I'm going to be in Scotland and I'm busy. So I, I don't have time to come down and have a conversation with you about this. Well, then Harry decides to circumvent his father and just go straight to the crown. So he writes that he rang granny on January 3rd. He says that they were coming back to Britain and he told her that, you know, he'd love to see her. He said that he explicitly told her that what he wanted to talk about was the plan to be sort of havesy. And she wasn't pleased with this news, but she also wasn't shocked. Could anybody be shocked? He's been, you know, blabbering and banging on and crying and weeping. And, you know, him and his wife have been holding each other and rocking back and forth and distraught for ages now. Everyone knew eventually they were going to come to the conclusion that they wanted the riches and the fame, but they didn't want to have to do the job. So she's not pleased, but she said, look, I mean, I, I saw this coming. So he's all, you know, buttering her up and saying, you know, all I need is a good chat with my granny. You know, let me come and talk to you and then maybe we can sort something out. So he says, you know, are you free? She says, of course, I'm free all week. So you come when you can. The diary is clear. And he says, that's great, we're gonna come for tea, and then we'll drive back to London. Because they said, you know, they had some things they had to do. Granny, out of the generosity of her heart, says, you know, you'll be so exhausted, don't drive all over the place. Just come stay here in Sandringham. So he agrees that that would be easier, and he told her so. That would be lovely, thank you. And she says, you know, are you planning to see your father too? And, you know, of course he can't take he can't pass up an opportunity to throw Pa under the bus. And he's like, well, I asked, but he said it was impossible. Said he's gonna be stuck up in Scotland. Can't, he, he can't leave to the end of a month. Can't leave to see his son. And he, to hear him retell it, Granny's over there. She, Granny made a little sound, a sigh or a knowing grunt. I had to laugh. She said, well, I've only one thing to say about that. Yes. And your father always does what he wants to. Um, so I don't even know what that exchange was. Was that him trying to, to let us know that everybody secretly knew his dad was the worst? I don't know. Anyway, he says that they boarded a flight and while he was boarding the flight, he got a frantic note from his staff saying that the bee had informed them that granny actually wasn't available and she wasn't going to be available all week. Well... Harry interprets this that somebody is gunking up the works, that somebody has arrived and, you know, wrestled his grandmother's diary out of her hands and covered the pages with all sorts of engagements, false, real, whatever, just to thwart him. And he says to Meg, they're blocking me from seeing my grandmother. It's weird to me that he doesn't understand who his grandmother is. Like maybe she was free when y'all had a conversation. Things come up all the time. Things come up all the time. Um, he says that they, when they landed, they went to say to um, Sandringham and, you know, to hell with the bee. Who is he to block me? He's not my real dad. He says they went to their home at Frogmore. And they rang Granny again. And, you know, he, he's having these flashbacks of, back when he was in Iraq and the red phone would be ringing and he's imagining that red phone in Granny's office. And you know, it's all coming back to him. He was at war then and he's at war now. So Granny picks up. Hello. Hi Granny, it's Harry. Sorry, I must have misunderstood you the other day when you said that you didn't have anything going on all day, all week. Did I misunderstand that? What part of you being free did I not understand? And Granny says that, you know, she saw her, but something came up. Can I pop in tomorrow though, Granny? Surely I can pop in tomorrow. And she says, no, I, I really am busy all week. 
Harry says that she didn't sound like herself to him. So he says, you know, is the bee in the room with you? Because, of course, he believes that his grandmother is just of uh, declining mental faculties and that she is being driven, you know, goaded by these three insect courtiers who are telling her what to do at every turn of the way. So he says, is the bee in there with you? No answer. Like, she's too afraid to stand up to Harry. Um, and so that ends that. It just didn't work. He wanted to see her. Then she basically lied to him and you know thanks to the bee he can't get anywhere so um let's see right after this disappointing juncture they get word from sarah remember that's their i think comms director that the son was about to run a story saying that the, they were stepping away from their royal duties to spend more time in canada he says that there was this sad little man who wrote for the newspaper who was not a royal correspondent. Just some kind of entertainment editor. And why had he been assigned to the story? <laughs> well, Harry, it's because you haven't done anything except be like a celebrity. You're, you're just a, a face. You, you know, technically you're one of the royals. But what have you done except flit around and kind of hang out and like sort of live the celebrity lifestyle? So of course they're going to assign the entertainment guy to you because you're nothing more than entertainment. You don't work. So why, I mean, what, what are they going to report on other than the fact that, you know, you don't do anything. What is there to report about? So he says that they had just, they'd assigned the story to the showbiz guy. And he said that he despised this guy. You know, he was some kind of quasi-royal correspondent. And that he had this sort of secret relationship with this close friend of William's comms secretary who was over there constantly feeding this guy little bits of information, which he says <laughs> mostly those were just, you know, gossipy things that weren't even true. I mean, most of them weren't true. Well, which ones were true? You know, when he when he has to admit that some of them were, were true, you know that probably like 98% of it was true. Anyway, he says that they were horrified because they didn't want this joker to be the one giving out their news, that they were working on a plan to separate from the royal family. They didn't want someone else breaking the news. They didn't want someone else twisting the story. Maybe somebody could get married and they could go break the news at that person's wedding. Anyway, um, he says that he phoned Granny to tell her about the son. And they thought maybe she would let them hurry up and make a statement. And she said she understood she'd allow it. But, you know, don't add to the speculation. Just say something very bland. You know, be calm. Don't stoke the fire. Just, you can say something, but it doesn't need to be outrageous. So, he says that when Granny said that he could say something, he writes, I didn't tell her exactly what our statement would say. She didn't ask, but also I didn't fully know yet. I gave her the gist, however, and I mentioned some of the basic details that I'd outlined in a memo that Pa had demanded and which she'd seen. So he says the wording had to be really precise. Again, it needed to be bland, it needed to be calm. You know, let's not assign blame, let's not stoke the fires, must not add speculation, all this. It was a formidable writing challenge. I hope he worked harder on that than he did on this book. He says that they soon realized it just wasn't going to be possible to get ahead of the story. That showbiz guy already had his story written, so they weren't going to be able to get ahead of it. So that night, the news broke. And the next day, it was the front page news. And he says that the story depicted their departure as a rollicking, carefree, hedonistic tapping out rather than the careful retreat and attempt at self-preservation. Isn't that so interesting? Like, look at him saying, you know, that that wasn't what they were doing, that this was some kind of careful attempt at self-preservation. But it's like, you literally just told us the truth versus the lie that you continue to tell yourself. According to you, this has been some kind of carefully planned exit, exit, but how can any of us see it as anything other than you just looking to go on an eternal and everlasting vacation? 
because you aren't really doing anything with your time. When, when you're off, you're not really doing anything with your time. It's you just, you know, hold up at your house, looking out the windows, peeking through the blinds, imagining chaos at every corner. H how is it that he can truly believe that this is not him just looking for uh, like a lifestyle of ease? But according to him, I mean, this was about mental and physical protection of him and his family. He also said, and this is what really just threw him on his back, that it included, this newspaper story included um, the telling detail that they had offered to relinquish their Sussex titles. And there had only been one document in which this had been stated, that being the memo he had written, his private and confidential letter to his father. So we all know who leaked this. Pa. Okay, Harry. Um, the thing is, is that like, you have to think about how many times that memo would have gone around to people in government because they have to make a decision. So Pa has to send that to somebody. There are people who have to sign off on this. It doesn't have anything to do with Pa throwing him under the bus, calling up somebody from, you know, the Daily Mail or the Sun and being like, by the way, I got news on my son. <laughs> Please, you know, it's like, these. Th this could have been leaked from anybody. So anyway, he writes this, <sighs> there's the rest of this whole section uh, is all about um, him gathering a team together, staying up all hours of the night. Um, they've gone to the stateroom, there's a grand wooden desk, him, his staff, Megan, there they all are, each going over to the laptop, typing out a few sentences, then going over to lay down on a couch. Somebody else comes over, sits down at the laptop, types out a few sentences, goes and lays down on a couch. Somebody else staggers over, reads it feverishly, puts in a comma, goes over and sits down and has a cup of tea. It's like this long, long process where everybody, it's like a bunch of cooks in the kitchen trying to come up with some kind of a statement. It's the most ridiculous scenario. Like, why are y'all all working on it like this? What kind of a method is this to write anything meaningful? <laughs> I just, I, here's the thing. I cannot imagine relinquishing the authority of a statement to anybody, like to a group effort that, that was of this importance. Like, I would want to write that out myself. And I'm not saying I wouldn't need somebody to help me edit it or look over it and decide, like, okay, is this really what we want to say? But... The idea that you would just kind of, all of you have this kind of, you know, hangout sesh where you each are trying your hand at, you know, well, what do you think about this word? What do you think about this sentence? What? At one point, Harry wanders out of the room over to the Christmas tree that happens to be outside the stateroom. This huge, enormous Christmas tree. Starts plucking off different ornaments and then staggers back into the room and hands out gifts to everybody. Oh, uh, hey, you want this? Well... I got this cute little corgi ornament. Oh, this one's for you. Thanks for your effort. Oh, I got, uh, I got another one with these. You want that one? It's like, what are you robbing the queen for? And then handing out prizes to your little friends in, in the stateroom all working on the statement. Like, that was, it was like the weirdest little story. And he says that they were all a little concerned, like, I don't know if I should be taking stuff off the queen's Christmas tree. Oh, it's all right. No one's going to notice. And he says this. They were all touched, but a bit guilty. I assured them. Now what's gonna miss them? Words that seemed like a double-edged sword. <laughs> I, that is like, this is like the most tiresome drama. Like, what is that? Now one's gonna miss them. <laughs> Just like they won't miss us. Okay. Um, he says that later that day, um, it took him a whole day to write this. It makes me want to go read the statement and see, like, what did what did this group of individuals actually come up with? But anyway, he says that they finally, finally, finally came up with a final draft. Everybody's so weary. Everyone's rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. Everyone, you know, barely stand up from the exhaustion. Um, everyone in the room was all worried that their involvement would be discovered. Um, and what would it mean for their jobs if anyone knew that they had helped Megan and Harry to draft this rebellious statement? Uh, but mostly they were excited. They felt like they were on the side of right. And he said that, you know, 
everybody involved in that had read every word of the abuse in the press. And really, truly, if you are a, per were a person of any worth, weight, or decency, you would have jumped right in on this and, and helped those staffers. So every single person in that room was, you know, this was the cream of the crop when it came to staff. These were the people who cared about human rights. He says, finally at 6 p.m. they were done. They gathered around the laptop, read the draft one last time. This one staffer messaged the private secretaries of Granny, Pa, and Willie. And Willie's guy replied immediately, you know, this is going to go nuclear. It's such a, I mean, truly, 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 in the grand scheme of all things eternal, who gives a flip about what Harry and Meghan decided to do? I mean, when I consider all the things that they are so, like, this is going to go nuclear. Do you understand there are people starving in the world? That there are people who are, you know, slaves in cobalt mines, who have a baby strapped to their back and they work from sun up to sun down so you can have an iPhone. Like there are real problems in this world. What in the world, it, like Carrie's colossal self-involvement makes me so angry. This is gonna go nuclear. Like <laughs> you're just wanting to live you know, this hedonistic lifestyle. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. It really doesn't like pe people talk about it. I mean, I'm making a channel about it. Like truly, truly, truly what a waste of time on so many levels. But the fact that he thinks that this is, you know, that, that his actions are just going to rock a nation. It's like, yeah, I mean, everybody has paid way too much attention to this story on so many levels because at the end of time, will anything have ever changed because he decided to just be lazy? I can tell you that there will be consequences to his laziness because he didn't do good with what he had when he had a chance to do it. But as far as his life being the linchpin by which all things were held together, hardly. Anyway, um, I'll get off my soapbox. But he says that they finished. Um, and then of course he knew that so many Britons were gonna be shocked and saddened, churned his stomach. But the thing is, is that this was what had to be done. This was the truth and he uh, had to tell it. He was an honest person. So one of the staffers turns to him and goes, are we doing this? Meg and I both said, yes, there's no other choice. Yeah, there is a choice, it's called grow up. There is a choice, it's called, um, I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna live that lifestyle. I'm gonna live the lifestyle of an adult. What about that option? I wanna choose to do what I can for this world with the time that I have. Because, you know, Harry's never gonna, Harry's not gonna be laying on his deathbed being like, I'm really glad that I sued the son. He's gonna think, why didn't I spend more time on the charities that I said I cared about? Like, that's the shame that he's gonna have to live with on his deathbed. It's not, he's not gonna be over there I mean, maybe he will. Some of the things he does doesn't make sense to me. Maybe he really will lay on his deathbed and be like, I really stuck it to the man. But I truly believe that deep down in his heart, he's not resting well with the, the decisions he's made. Okay, carrying on. He says that, um, okay, so the statement goes out. Um, he says that <laughs> Meg and I walked out of the palace and jumped into our car. As we sped toward Frogmore, the news was already on the radio. Every channel. We picked one. Magic FM. Meg's favorite. <laughs> Hers would be Magic FM. We listened to the presenter. And he was working himself into a very British lather. We held hands. We shared a smile with the bodyguards in the front seat. And we all gaze silently out of the window, grinning to ourselves about the scheme that we had just managed to pull off. I love how he says that they were they hated to do it and their stomachs were churning, but then they're over there sharing secret smiles with each other. That doesn't sound like the actions of somebody whose stomach is churning. Okay, so he says that a couple of days later, there was a meeting at Sandringham. He says he doesn't remember who called it the Sandringham Summit, probably the press. He says that on his way there, Marco, remember Marco from the early days, um, had texted him about a story in the Times. And here, Willie was declaring that he and I were now separate entities. 
According to this article, William had said, quote, I've put my arm around my brother all our lives, and I can't do that anymore. I think it's interesting that he says Marco said it to him, as if what he's saying is Marco was siding with me. He was letting me know how William had betrayed me. But, you know, that this is so classic Harry, because Marco was William's before he was ever Harry's. And he was William's personal secretary. Now, Harry had clung on to Marco, thinking Marco was like the bomb.com, but I just don't think that that's the way that text went down. What I think is, I think Marco said, what has become of the two of you? What is happening with you both? Not like, can you believe what your brother's saying about you? But that's what, how Harry would have us believe it by just dropping in, then Marco sent me this text, you know? It's just so typical of this entire book. It's so one-sided. Okay, so he says that the real problem here about this summit was that Meg had gone back to Canada to be with Archie. So he was on his own. He was on his own for the summit. He said that he had gone over. Um, he immediately spotted Granny by the fireplace, so he scuttled over to take a seat next to her. She was sitting on a bench, and he sat down beside her. But of course, the wasp came buzzing over. And a moments later returned with Pa, who sat beside Harry. And then shortly after that, Willie comes scuttling over. He says that Willie, Willie looked like he wanted to murder me. <sighs> what? Hello, Harold. He sat across from me. Separate entities, indeed. He uh, writes that when all the participants had arrived, they shifted to the long conference table and Granny was at the head and they commenced. Well, he then gives his summary of why he felt that this was his only recourse um, to say that they were going to move to Canada. By the way, they had not hammered out the details for what his life would now look like. So he's preemptively said, you know, we're going to go live this lifestyle. But that hasn't been sanctioned by anyone yet. They just felt like they were in competition with the showbiz guy who wrote an article about them. So then they felt like they had to hustle up and say something about it. But it was so premature because nothing had actually officially been decided yet. So this is the meeting where they're gonna decide, okay, officially, what are we sanctioning you to do? So if it all looked like a mess, it's because it was a mess. Um, all right, so he says, and this is his definition of how his life has gone. I reference their cruel and criminal behavior, the press, you know. And but said that they had a ton of help. This family had enabled the papers by looking the other way or by actively courting them. And some of our staff had worked directly with the press, briefing them, planting stories, occasionally rewarding and fetting them. The press was a big part of why we'd come to this crisis. Their business model demanded that we be in constant conflict. But they weren't the only culprits, and I wanted everyone at the table to know that. He said he looked at Willie, expecting that Willie would jump in and be like, Yeah, Pa and Camilla, you guys are part of the problem. But of course, William didn't do that. Instead, he said, You know, I'm really upset about a story that's come out today that paints me as the bully who's bullying you out of the family. We know that's not true. And I really resent the fact that there's a story out there right now saying that I have cast you out into the abyss by bullying you, pushing you out, and trying to, you know, lord over you. You know that's not what's happening. So Harry felt that what William was implying was, you say we're leaking things, but it seems to me like maybe you're planting some stories. Well, Harry quickly comes to his own defense on that. And he says, and listen to this, this is such a weak excuse. We had nothing to do with that story. But imagine how you'd feel if we had leaked it. Now then you know how Meg and I have felt all these last three years. Okay, you say you didn't leak it, but that's exactly what everybody else is saying, yet you refuse to believe that. So it's not okay for you to say, you know, I, I don't believe you aren't leaking, but I, you know, I'm not leaking. You are, but I'm not. Okay, but by what? By what measure am I supposed to believe that? You have no evidence that anybody at this table has leaked anything. You think you do because things from that one memo were leaked, but that wasn't Pa. That could have been any number of people in that office who could have just taken a picture of it with their phone. Anybody could have seen that. 
Like, that is like the sorriest defense. I ain't have anything to do with that. But what if I, you know, think how bad you feel if I did. That's not, that's not an excuse. Okay, so Granny's like, let's move on. Let's start talking about some options. So there was five options that had been laid on the table. The first was, we're just gonna go with this, the status quo. Nothing changes. You guys are going to continue to proceed as usual. Meg and Harry won't leave. Everyone tries to go back to normal. All the way down to option five, which was full severance, no royal role, no working for Granny, a total loss of security. Well, as you can imagine, Harry didn't want either of those. He was more interested in kind of option three. Option three was somewhere in between. It was a compromise. Um, it was the closest to what he had initially said he wanted. And Harry told everybody assembled that he was desperate to keep security. That was all he wanted because, I mean, as it stood, he, his wife, and his son had giant targets on their back. And there was absolutely no way they would survive without security. I mean, they'd be gunned down in the streets within minutes. So all he cared about was his family's physical safety. And he wanted to prevent a repeat of history. Harry, your mother was killed by a drunk driver. She was not wearing a seatbelt. She was not killed by the paparazzi. How many times are you going to lie to yourself about the scenario surrounding your mother's death? so that you can keep prattling on and making your life more interesting. <laughs> the paparazzi are around everywhere. They're not though. They are not. I would just love to see even just half of the stories he claims were written. I would love to just see half of the pictures he claims were taken. I would love to see one smidgen of evidence to prove that they were hounded beyond anything reasonable in this world. No, there's no proof of it. Okay, so he says he's got to have security. I mean, if he doesn't get one other thing, he's got to have security. And so, I mean, he consulted palace veterans and they all said that option three was a completely legitimate option. It was totally doable and there was no reason why Harry should suspect anything else of happening. Nobody was so unreasonable as not to give them option three. Well, but the family, of course, pushed me to take option one. Barring that, they would only accept option five. <laughs> Can you believe the monstrous, outrageous, outlandish hatred in their hearts for me, my wife and my baby? So he said they discussed option five for nearly an hour. Finally, the bee got up and passed out some statements, some pre- composed statements that they would release to the press saying that they had come up with option five. Wait, oh, well, I'm confused. You've already drafted a statement before any discussion announcing option five. Well, well in other words, the fix was in this whole time. This summer was just for show. No answer. I asked if there were other drafts of other statements announcing the other options. Well, well, you well, yes, of course, of course, said the bee. Well, I want to see him then. And the bee said that that unfortunately wasn't possible because just as he was about to print this one out, the printer jammed. Um, so he'd only been able to get out option five, but you know, in his computer, there were the other drafts. Well, Harry didn't buy that. Um, and he stands up. You know, as you can imagine, he's swept right through his suit. Is this some kind of a joke? I've got to get out here and get some air. Granny, I, I, can, I, can I go get some air? Granny said he could. So he staggers out of the room, goes out and walks the, the long hall. Who should he run into but Mr. R, the former upstairs neighbor of the Badger set. They could see he was upset and said, is there anything that they can do to help? Mr. R was with Lady Susan, one of Granny's uh, ladies in waiting. Anyway, they all said, you know, is there anything they can do? Because Harry's just, you know, absolutely foaming at the mouth. No, no, there's nothing anyone can do for him. He goes back into the room and he said that there was some more discussion about the coveted option three. Or was it option two? Nobody seemed to be able to figure it out. Harry said that he had a headache and they were starting to wear him down. He was just so vulnerable, you know, without Meg right there. He says, oh, I didn't bloody care which option we adopted. So long as security remained in place, I played it for continuation of the same armed police protection that I'd had since birth. 
And since I had needed since birth, let me remind you, I'd never been allowed to go anywhere without three armed bodyguards, even when I was supposedly the most popular member of the family. And now I was the target, along with my wife and son, of unprecedented hate. And the leading proposal under discussion called for total abandonment? Oh, my lord, what in the world? It was all madness. Um, and then he says that, listen to how bad it had gotten. He offered to defray the cost of security out of his own pocket. I wasn't sure how I'd do that, but I'd find a way. <laughs> I don't know, out of the coffers of your millions. How about tap into that, you know, reserve that your mother had set aside for you? How about that? Um, he said that he made one last pitch. You know, look, please, please. Have mercy. Meg and I don't care about perks. We care about working, serving, and staying alive. <laughs> it's so dramatic. Working, serving. Okay, sir, would you mind describing vaguely? You don't have to get into detail. Just tell me bullet points. What what work have you been doing? What, what charities have you been uh, associated with? What work? can we expect you to continue doing when no work has been done for about three years? I mean, just like, who does he think he is? What life does he think we've all been watching him live? That we would be, that, that, that we could begin to believe that all you care about is working, serving. And staying alive. Um, he says that the meeting closed um, and there was a basic general agreement that they would sort it out, sort of out of over a 12 month transitional period. They all rose, Granny walked out, but Harry had unfinished business. He says that he had to find out about that printer. If they thought they were gonna scam and scheme him, no sir. So he says that he walked, um, he was gonna find the bee's office and find out about that malfunctioning printer. Just as he was looking and sniffing around for the office, who should he run into but one of the queen's friendliest pages who'd always liked him. He asked for directions and the page said, you know, I'll take you right there. So he brings him through the kitchen, up some back stairs down a narrow alley. It's just down that way, says the page. A few steps later, he comes to a huge printer that's just dashing out documents. And the bee's assistants, you know, swings around and says, hello. I pointed at the printer and said, this seems to be working fine. Yes, your royal highness. It's not broken. That thing? It's indestructible, sir. I asked about the printer in the bee's office. That one worked too. Oh, yes, sir. D did you need to print something out? No, thank you. He says he went down a familiar corridor. Look, it's the same place I had to stay in at that Christmas after the South Pole incident. And just as he should go, be walking around the corner, who should he run right into? Smack right into with the bee. The bee saw me, looked extremely sheepish. Harry's favorite word. He could tell what I was up to. He heard the printer whirring away and he knew he was busted. Oh, sir, please, sir, don't worry about that. It's, it's really not important. Isn't it? So he goes downstairs, he's all mad, he's all upset. Um, he, someone suggests that he and Willie take a, you know, just, just step outside, cool your heads. So they go, both of them are freezing cold. They didn't have really any kind of coats on. He had a lead jacket, poor Willie's got nothing but a sweater on. And as he's walking the grounds, he's thinking about how beautiful it all is. In the same way he had thought about the stateroom when he'd been in there, just, it was just so beautiful, so palatial. How, why, how had he never noticed this before? He says, you know, these gardens, I thought they're paradise. Why can't we just enjoy them? But have you tried just enjoying them? No, because that's not exciting. Where's the adrenaline rush in enjoying a beautiful garden? Anyway, he braced himself for a lecture, but lo and behold, Willie didn't, didn't come and attack him. You know, there he thought that Willie was gonna rush at him, biting him in the jugular, but as it turned out, Willie was subdued. He says that Willie wanted to listen, and for the first time in a long time, his brother heard him out and he was so grateful. Um, 
And then he, it's just like, how, are, how can you begin to tell me that William's the bad guy? At the end of every story, William turns out to be the great guy. Um, he writes that, I told him about one past staff member sabotaging Meg, plotting against her. And I told him about how one current staff member whose close friend was taking payments for leaking private stuff to the press about Meg and me. My sources on this were above reproach, including several journalists and barristers. Plus, I'd made a visit to New Scotland Yard. Willie really frowned. He and Kate had their own suspicions. He'd look into it. And we agreed to keep talking. Yeah, Willie sounds like a, like a real bastard. Okay, um, so then he talks about how just on the heels of this healing moment with William. What should come out but a statement with his name on it that he had not agreed to. And here's the statement. He says that a strongly worded denial had been put out by the palace squashing the morning's bullying story, the one that William had been concerned about, saying, I, I'm not pushing you out and I don't know where this story is coming from. He says that the denial was signed by none other than me and Willie. My name attached by faceless others to words I'd never seen, let alone approved? I was stunned. But exactly why? Because when you were in that meeting, you told William, I didn't write, I didn't leak that, I don't know anything about that. You know, I know that it's hurtful for you that the press is writing stories that don't make sense, but exactly, that's my whole point. So, he hadn't seen the statement, but his sentiment in the meeting was, I don't support that that story in the news. I didn't write that. I didn't leak that. That's not my feeling. So he hadn't written in writing that he didn't like the story, but he verbalized it to everybody there. So I, I would assume that the palace, in a desire to get ahead of that negative story, because no, people love nothing more than a dispute between brothers, and in a desire to get ahead of that, they just said, okay, we've heard him say he didn't do it. We've heard him say he doesn't agree with it. We'll just go ahead and put his name on this because we know that's how he feels. He said so. So why is Harry now so outraged about a statement that presumably he agreed with? This is so much like the leaked letter to daddy um, that Meg wrote and then being scandalized that it had been leaked to the press, but she stood behind every word of it. So what do you care if somebody else reads it? It's a private letter, but who cares? In the same way, you stated to William, I don't know what, where that story came from and I don't agree with it. Okay, so now let's let the comms people go out and say something and you're scandalized by this? I, it's like, I, you've never seen somebody more eager to be outraged. So he, you know, stumbles back to Frogmore and he says that about this time, around Jan January 18th, 2020, the palace had announced that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex had agreed to step back and would no longer be formally representative of the queen and their um, royal titles would be in abeyance during the transitional year. They'd also offered to reimburse the sovereign grant for refurbishments to Frogmore Cottage since they would no longer be staying there. And there was a firm no comment on the status of their security. So the, well, the one thing that Harry wanted to know about, people were holding out on him in typical fashion. He says that he got back to Vancouver. He had a delicious reunion with Meg, Archie, and the dogs. But for a few days, he just couldn't fully be back and be present. He says part of him was still in Britain, still at Sandringham. I spent hours glued to my phone and the internet, monitoring the fallout. The eye had directed at us by the papers and the trolls was alarming. So you finally get to go be with your kid and all you can do is look at your phone. Sounds like great parenting. The Daily Mail said that make no mistake, it was an absolute slap across the face of the queen. He might as well have just gone and spit in her eye. Um, and you know, on and on and on and on. Um, he says that he shook his head. There was just no mercy. It was all the language of war, his favorite thing. Um, but what shocked me was this passage here. He says, clearly this was more than simple anger. These men and women saw me as an existential threat. If our leaving posed a threat to the monarchy, as some were saying, then it posed a threat to all those covering the monarchy for a living. Doesn't he understand that there's more to the monarchy than people just having a chance to write about it? 
Like, how little does he understand the role of his own family in government? If he thinks that the whole reason that the press is upset at the threat he has posed is because now they won't have something to write about? What a slap in the face of all the things that his grandmother has accomplished over all her years, all the charities that the family has funded, all the, all the spotlights that the various members have placed on things that matter, all the work of, that his own mother had done for AIDS and for landmines and for all these other charities that she had with her winning presence managed to create so much attention for in a positive way. And then for him to say, they just don't want the monarchy to go away because then they won't have anything to write about. Really? You really shouldn't have been a prince. Um, okay, so people are saying that Harry didn't tell his grandmother they was going to leave. He just suddenly got into a plane and never came back. Who would even believe that? You know, so again, yeah, these, you know, if people are saying wild things about you, wild and unbelievable things, you don't need to carry that on your back. Who cares what they say? No one believes that. Um, he says, I sat up late, brooding on all of it, going over the progression of events and asking myself, what's the matter with these people? What makes them like this? Just go live your life. You finally have what you said you wanted. But of course he can't because he's just wringing his hands about the state of his security. Um, he says that one of the things that people were most mad about was the amount of money that Harry and Meghan had spent on their lifestyle as royals. So we know that Meghan's clothing budget was through the roof and she didn't honestly do that many engagements, but somehow she spent the most on clothes. Um, you know, what I, one of the things I love so much about Catherine, amongst the many things I love so much about her, is the fact that you often see her wearing things that she's had remade so that they look new and fresh, but they're, they're dresses that she's had and redone so that she's not being wasteful with the beautiful clothes that she has. We'll see her um, wearing a dress, you know, and maybe she's, the sleeves are different or there's a different um, sash on it or, you know, whatever. But she does that frequently. She's not a waster of money. And anyway, so he says that also people were horrified by how much had been spent at the wedding. And he wants you to know that half of that was for the security that of course they had to have because he and Megan were just such an inflammatory couple that were it not for the security that had been provided at the wedding, how would they even be alive today? I mean, that was the true question. So he says that security experts themselves had told him that the snipers and sniffer dogs weren't just there necessarily for Harry and Meghan, although they definitely had needed them, but they were really there for everybody else so that, you know, some wild person would come start shooting into the crowd or a suicide bomber blowing things up at the parade route. Yeah, they're also there for the queen and all the dignitaries that happen to be there. It's like, he doesn't need to explain to me why they had security there. No one thought all the security was there for him and Megan. That was like a delusion that he has been on and on about. Like, I looked up and there was the snipers. And now he's trying to come around and be like, actually, they weren't really for us. You just already told me earlier in the book that they were there for you. Did you not know why they were there? Um, anyway, um, then he wants to go on and on and on about how People were upset about the way, um, what their taxes were being used for. And he goes on, he, he tries to be, you know, history buff there and talk about the history of the crown and the tax money. I, I don't really want to hear it from him. I don't think he knows much about the subject. Um, but then he says that he wasn't trying to undermine the authority of the monarchy with his decision. It had nothing to do with that. And he writes this. My problem had never been with the monarchy, nor the concept of monarchy. It's been with the press and the sick relationship that's involved between it and the palace. I love my mother country. I love my family. And I always will. I just wish at the second darkest moment of my life, they'd both been there for me. And I believe they'll look back one day and wish they had to. Please. You're going to try to tell me that the country was not behind you when your mother died? 
what is talking about at the second darkest moment of my life i just wish that the country and my family had been there for me your family was there for you your country was there for you when your mother died there was such an outpouring of love for you and your brother H horrified that this had been something that you had had to deal with all right so then he moves on he says now okay they've gotten their their freedom but where are they going to live they considered canada by and large it had been good for them but the thing was they they ultimately they had to find a place that the press didn't know about in Canada? I think you can find any number of places in Canada where you're gonna have some peace and quiet. I'm pretty sure that the majority of Canada is full of peace and quiet. Anyway, he says that Meg got in touch with a Vancouver friend who connected us um, to an estate agent and they started looking at houses. I don't know if they were looking at houses. Mansions, but um, they were taking some steps. They're trying to be positive. I mean, it was hard, you know, what with so much pressure on them. One, I mean, all they could really think about was their security. He says that one night Meg had asked him, you don't think that they'll ever pull our security to you? And never, not in this climate of hate, not after what happened to my mother. And, and, and what was that again? What happened to her? Can you explain? Um, then he's got to throw Andrew under the bus. Now, look, I don't think any of us are defending Andrew, but there wasn't any reason for him to drag Andrew into it. He says, also, not in the wake of my uncle Andrew, he was embroiled in a shameful scandal, accused of the sexual assault of a young woman. And no one had so much as suggested that he'd lose his security. Or whatever grievances people had against us, sex crimes weren't on the list. Andrew would truly need some kind of protection. He's done things that have outraged people and made him people very angry. Um, and people have enough questions about the way he has behaved that there might be somebody out there mad enough to decide, you know, vengeance is mine, try to go get him. But Harry, exactly, you haven't committed any crimes that would mean that your life is in danger by people who want to play the vigilante. So. It would make more sense for Andrew to get security and for them not to give it to you. You don't need it. Okay. Um, so then he tells us this sad and, you know, devastating tale of woe. February 2020. I'd scooped Archie from his nap, took him out to the lawn. It was sunny and it was cold. We gazed out at the water and touched the dry leaves and collected rocks and twigs. I kissed his chubby little cheeks, tickled him. Again, yeah, because I couldn't help it, grabbed my phone. I glanced down at my phone to see a text from the head of our security team, Lloyd. He needed to see me. I carried Archie across the garden, handed him to Meg, then went across to the soggy grass at the cottage where Lloyd and the other bodyguards were staying. We sat on a bench, both of us wearing puffer jackets, waves rolling gently in the background. Lloyd told me that our security was being pulled and the whole team had been ordered to evacuate. Surely they can't. I tend to agree, but they are. So he says, you know, so much for the years of transition. They were supposed to have a whole year, but now Lloyd's saying that they got to go home. So here we are, I said, the ultimate nightmare, the sort of worst case scenario. Any bad actor in the world would now be able to find us and it would just be me with a pistol to stop them. And no, not even that, because we're in Canada, so I can't have a pistol. He rang Pa, who wouldn't take his calls. And then he got a text from Willie, you know. And Willie said, can you speak? I want to talk to you. Great. I was sure my older brother, after a recent walk in Sandringham Gardens, would be sympathetic. He'd step up. But no, he said it was a government decision. Nothing to be done. Um, well, that's because it's tax-funded security and you're not in the country anymore. So why should the British people fund something that they get no benefit from? Um, all right. So I really wanted to go on per the usual, but the hour has come. So I will, I'll leave us there. But that, that's where we're hanging. He's been told there's no security. Now, the next time we come together, we are going to be reading all about uh, what freeloaders they are and how Tyler Perry has offered them things 
and they you know can't even stop themselves immediately they are going to go and live in the lap of luxury with tyler perry so and by the way that whole story too i got some feelings on that so stay tuned for that it'll be out later this week um I was really grossed out by how self-involved Terry is in this whole thing. Like, it's just so gross to me. Why does he think he's so important? I just, I will never understand it. But he really thinks he is. And, you know, I'm, God bless him. I, I would never want to feel like I was that important to the world. Because can you imagine the weight on your, on you if you thought that every little thing you did mattered that much? Horrors. All right, I'll see you guys later this week. Bye-bye.